Over the last decade or so, uh, there's been much more talk about uh, what we would call like workplace culture or, or corporate culture, organizational culture perhaps. And like when we're applying for a job today, sometimes, you know, people will be thinking like, yes, do I have do I like the job description? Do I fit the bill? Or, you know, do I have the appropriate skills, as we just saw in this last skit? Uh, do I have the appropriate skills to do this job well? And th- those things are, are, are really key, of course, for a workplace and, and, and for getting involved somewhere. But often, it's, it's not just those questions people ask today, and I think rightly so. They ask things more and more like, what is the work culture like? Uh, More and more people who are doing the hiring on this end of it are saying, is this person going to be a good fit with our culture? Now, there's lots of nerdy uh, definitions of culture. I I almost had an anthropology minor by accident in my undergrad. I just took too many courses on, like, cultural studies, and and, and I, and I got to read lots of, like, complex, long definitions of culture, but... Uh, I think, and I came across this in a book a few years ago, that the best definition of culture that I know of goes like this. Uh, a culture is the way we do things around here. That's, that's it. That's what culture means. It's, it's the way we do things around here. So families have cultures. The way that you function as a family has a culture. Um, more than that, even cities have a culture. Kamloops, I would say, is really outdoor oriented. It is a sporty place. It's not called the tournament, tournament capital for no reason. I mean, I had a, um, I, I know a family uh, from town, and uh, they have three boys. Last weekend, they had 12 soccer games. And the fact that some of you weren't surprised by that just goes to show that's how we do things around here right? Um, So we talk about uh, cultural organization a lot of times in positive terms as well, like creativity is valued. We we love uh, collaboration. We want your voice to be heard at the table to give input. Um, We value excellence or we have a culture of appreciation, stuff like that, like the positive end of things. But, and we all know it, a big part of a cultural organization or the culture of an organization is not just what you are for. It's not just those, you know, kind of stated values in the positive sense. We all know that we need to know what a culture is not going to be like as well. Like a culture of favoritism, poor communication, a culture of competitiveness where employees are pitted against one another. And it's not always easy to codify those things about a culture that aren't so positive. So yes, we set a positive vision of a culture, but we also, we want to be clear about where those no-go zones are as well. We want to know uh, how things aren't going to be around here. And Paul's letter to the Ephesians makes clear that God's people have a culture, that we are a part of the culture of the kingdom, a very particular, even peculiar kind of culture. Now, we've seen in the first half of Ephesians, chapters 1 to 3, that essentially they describe the what of the wonder of what God has done for us, how God adopts us, forgives us, frees us, fills us by His Spirit, empowers us, makes us His one people, sends us on mission, unifies us. But the Christian faith is more than that, and chapters 4 through 6 They fill us in on the how. How do we live out? How do we embody the what? And the second half is all about the how. Uh, Christian people must become what we already are by God's grace. We learn to live into the new identity we've been given in Christ. I, I love the way Ricky put it last week. He said this, that the Christian faith is not just a what but a how. The what of the gospel is embodied in the how, how we live as God's own children. And this next section, what we're working through now, just takes us deeper into seeing both the positive and negative elements of how we do things around here, how the kingdom culture really works. And I think we not only need this kind of clarity, I think we desperately want it. Like, I want to be a part of that radical counterculture of the kingdom that has a beautiful vision of how to walk in love. And we're going to see that today. 
But I also want to know what are the things that we're saying no to, that we resist because they diminish our God-given humanity or they destroy community. So Paul is, in this section, really continuing his train of thought that he started in 417. We looked at that, and we've been moving through this, and he's getting more and more specific about some of these details. He's defining kingdom culture, we might say. So today, we're going to see how it's the king who is the one who defines the culture. We're going to see some contours of kingdom culture and what it means to live in sync with kingdom culture. I just invite you to pray with me as we open our hearts to what God has to say. Father, we thank you that you inspired the Apostle Paul to write these words to uh, a community or communities of people who were trying to figure out how to follow you, to understand the what of the gospel, but the how of putting into practice as well. And we ask for your help now. Open our hearts as we look to you. Amen. So if you have your Bibles with you, I'd invite you to open to Ephesians chapter 5, and we're looking at just verses 1 to 6 this morning. It'll be on the screen as well, so uh, follow along with me as I read. Here's what it says, follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God, but among you there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. This is the word of the Lord. Have you ever thought about getting a tattoo? Me neither. Okay. Uh, Now, it's not because I have anything against them. Um, It's just, I've just never had the desire. Uh, Maybe maybe it's because I hate pain. I mean, that might be part of it. Or I I think it actually probably has more to do with, like, I just don't even know how I would decide what to imprint on my body that would be there forever. I I just just don't even know how you decide on that. Um, But my my friend, like, (laughs) I'm I'm, kind of glad I didn't get one in, like, the early 2000s, in my early 20s. It'd probably be one of those, like, you know, barbed wire wraps around my arm to go with my puka shell necklace. But um, my, (laughs) my, my friend Matt, uh, my friend Matt got a tattoo. And so I asked him, like, how, how did you even decide what you were going to get imprinted on you forever? And he had some wisdom. He said, well, he said, you've got to decide what you want, and then you wait two years. And after two years, if you still want the same thing, then go for it. So he got the tattoo. And you're wondering, it was like the mid-2000s, so what, did he get the barbed wire wrap? Like, what, what, what did he go for? So he rolled up his sleeve to show me, and it actually, it became a test. He was testing me to see if all of those years of Greek study had actually paid off. And so he made me read it, and it went like this. Genesthe un mametai tu theu. Here's my rough translation. Be, therefore, imitators of God. My friend Matt got that tattooed on his arm. I'm not sure if there's a more intense set of words you could imprint on your body to remind you of what you're doing in life. But if you knew Matt, you'd say, oh, that checks out. Because that's the way he chose to order his life. I mean, this is actually the only place in the Bible that says it quite so starkly, imitate God mimic God. That word mimesis is where we get mimic from. Paul says you and I are to mimic the living God. What? Really? Now, we do have similar commands in the Bible. We have things like this in Leviticus 11, 45, and then repeat it again in 19, 2. The Lord God says to his people, be holy as I am holy. And then Peter draws on that same text and, and, and he, to say the same thing. He says this, But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, Be holy because I am holy, quoting Leviticus. Now Jesus himself, in the greatest sermon that has ever been preached, 
in Matthew 5 to 7, the Sermon on the Mount, he says it like this, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Then he concludes with this. He says, be perfect. Whoa. Now, it could be translated, be mature or be full or be whole or be complete. He says, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Are you overwhelmed yet? Imitate God, Paul says. And then Matt just goes and gets it tattooed on his arm so he'll never forget it. Bold move, Matt. Now, we might be curious, how on earth could you actually do that in real time? Like, in the, like, feeding your kids or going to school, how are you going to imitate God? And, of, of course, Paul doesn't mean in every possible way. You are not omnipresent. You cannot be everywhere at all times as God is. Don't imitate that. You are not omniscient. You can't know all things all the time. Even Jesus, the Son of God in his earthly life, put those things aside in order to be present as a human being. So he doesn't mean in every sense. So what does it mean to mimic God? Well, Paul tells us. Look again at verses 1 and 2. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. To mimic God is to order your life in the same way of walking that Jesus himself is leading you. It's it's to live the same pattern of life, which is what? Giving yourself up at great cost for the sake of others. We imitate God when we give ourselves away, when we seek the benefit, the good of others. Sacrifice is the word that's used of Jesus. And if you've had the pleasure of being a parent, and I know not everybody gets that pleasure, but if you, if you have, you know a little bit about that. You know that you will have to give deeply and generously and sacrificially for those kids. Or if you've ever been a good friend or a mentor, maybe you're a youth leader. We talked about giving thanks for youth leaders, and I really do. Because you know that to be a good friend, it will cost you. It'll cost your time. It'll cost you emotional energy. You will have to learn to listen well. It will cost you tears and long talks. It will cost you bearing with other people with their failures and theirs with yours. So to be clear, the command to imitate God by imitating Jesus' pattern of life, this doesn't simply come about because I'm such a good person. In and of myself, I cannot imitate God. In and of yourself, you cannot imitate God. Oh, you can make an attempt, for sure. But this comes out of a place. Now, Paul's already said in 4 verse uh, 24 of Ephesians that we are being made new. We are created to be like God. Notice both of those are in the passive voice. That means someone else is the actor. We're the one being acted on. It is God who makes us new. It is God who creates us. That is God's work. I cannot make me new. You cannot make you new. But God does that work. So imitating God in and of myself is impossible. I cannot love like Jesus loves. Not on my own. My intentions, my motives they would almost certainly be mixed up some way in a self-centered impulse. But, and here is the good news, the key to all of this, to imitating God, comes in this first phrase. It says, therefore, as dearly loved children. That word therefore points back to all that Paul has said. And what is that? That through Jesus' life and death and resurrection, God has done everything necessary to make us his very own children, to forgive us, to free us, to save you by his grace, to fill and empower you with his spirit. He puts the very life of the living God in you. That's how you imitate God, is by leaning on the spirit and the spirit's help. Now, because of all that, because you are dearly loved children, be like your dad. Paul says. Imitate his way of love. So everything Paul will go on to say now is about the culture of the kingdom. It's all, it's, these seem like maybe moral bits, or, um, but they're not just moral bits. 
they are about the imitation of the very life of God. We could say it like this, being the beloved enables us to love. Knowing we are children of the Most High empowers us to reflect and resemble our Father. God has clothed you with a new life, and now it's up to us to learn how to embody that new life. You know, uh, there's, this, um, there's this show where one of the main characters, his name is Richie, at the beginning of the show, um, he's working in a restaurant, he's a part of the restaurant team, and he is abrasive, he is cussing, he's deeply insecure, and that comes out in anger and shouting, and it's, it's honestly, it's just really hard to watch him, because everywhere he goes, he's creating chaos. And you kind of find out why, actually, as the show goes on, you find out that things have broken down with his family, with his wife, and, and you see these moments of tenderness come through as he tries to love and care for his daughter well, but he's living with this deep insecurity, and, and the clothes he's wearing just... Uh, you, you see this insecurity come out in this anger and frustration. And at one point, uh, as they're preparing to open a new restaurant, his boss sends him to work at a place. It's, it's known as probably the best restaurant in the whole of the world, the most excellent place to work. So his boss sends him to go and get some experience in that kitchen just for a week, for just over a week. And while he's there, he begins to pick up on this other culture. He sees these people who actually care about the job they're doing. They see these details and the people they're serving as, with this intensity. Like they're in the business because of a passion to provide the best experience possible for those that they serve, for their guests. And after a week, the first week, all he's asked to do is to clean forks. One week, what is your job? Just clean forks. Just do that well. And he's cleaning forks for a whole week. And finally, the mentor who's been kind of overseeing this uh, shows up and he pulls him aside and he gives him this suit to put on. He's going to learn the front of house at this point. And there's this moment, he's putting on the suit jacket and he says to his mentor, he says, it kind of feels like armor. And, and the guy responds, says, yeah, man, that's the point. And there's this shift that happens in him almost instantly once he puts that suit on. The penny drops and he just wants to live into what that suit is saying. He feels like a different person in that suit. And he wants to live out that new identity. So he goes back to work with his boss. And he says, I get it now. And he's wearing a suit. And he says, I wear suits now. And you see him. He begins to live into that. He's kind He's clear with his communication. He's committed to forming a kind of culture around him that's reflective of the suit that he's wearing. Remember this, God gives us a new set of clothing. He clothes us so that we are changed. We are new people. We put on this new identity. And I think like Richie, we need to say, I wear suits now. I live differently because what God has clothed me in through the work of Jesus. Now, Ricky made this connection um, last week, and I think it was so helpful. It's like those who put on a uniform to go to work. If you're a police officer, you'll know this. Uh, if you work as in the medical profession, maybe you're putting on scrubs before you go into uh, to surgery. Um, maybe you're a judge, and like a, a judge, she puts on a robe. There's this set of purpose. There's a set of fittingness for how you behave when you're in those new clothes, how you live out your task in that place. And we have been given a task. As God's people, we are to reflect and resemble our Father. Be holy as I am holy, says the Scriptures. Live in such a way that is fitting for the kingdom culture. We are called to, to make Jesus in his love and his truth known to the world around us. So we've been given a new set of clothing like Richie putting on that new suit, it reminds us, right, I'm living for King Jesus and I am living like King Jesus. And we remember that likeness, that way of walking is following the one who has served us so deeply. Look again what it says there. Just as Jesus gave himself up. Now, gave himself up has at least two meanings here, two senses. First, Jesus gives himself in our place. Like he goes to the cross to substitute 
our sin for his righteousness. He clothes us in righteousness, says Isaiah. There's this substitution that happens. He exchanges his life for ours, glory to Jesus for that. And the second sense is this. Jesus gives himself for our benefit. He's serving our best interest. So to follow God, to mimic God, Paul is saying this. We can love because we are being loved. You are being loved by Jesus. I love it. And just before Jesus goes to the cross, uh, in John chapter 13, it pictures Jesus taking off his robe and putting on the uniform of a servant. He, he puts on the clothing of a servant. He gets onto his knees and he begins to wash the feet of his disciples. Um, there is no place in antiquity, there is no record of a superior dressing as a slave and washing the feet of the inferiors until Jesus. He is washing your feet. Jesus is serving you. He is loving you. Why do we wash feet? Because he's already washed ours. We can serve others' interests because Jesus is serving ours. We can give freely, deeply, sacrificially because he gave for us. We love because we're the beloved. And it's that belovedness to God that gives us a deep sense of security so we can love others not to get something from them, just for them, just for their benefit. Now, some of you might be uh, listening in at this point, and maybe you've been checking out who Jesus is and what he's all about for some time now, but maybe for you, you just need to focus in on what this would mean. Maybe for you, it's time to take that first step of opening your life to the one who's loved you in that way, to take that step of giving your whole life yes to his great yes over you. You can do that today. Or maybe if you're not all the way there in terms of believing the news of Jesus, if you still like, I've still got questions, remember this. Jesus invited his disciples to follow him before they knew who he really was. It was on the journey that they were beginning to discover that this really is the Son of God. But it took them, all the, it took them almost three years to begin to get it. So maybe for you, maybe it's like this. Maybe you just begin to follow Jesus to say, okay, I don't know about all of this intellectually yet, but let me try it on. Let me see how the suit fits. And maybe as you start doing that, you'll find out that you are the beloved. For others still, maybe, maybe you just need to ask yourself something like this. In what ways is God nudging me to more truly reflect him, his character in my day-to-day Life. Maybe that's your question today because the kingdom culture is set by the character of the king. We mimic him. Now, if the king sets the culture, what does that look like? Now, we've already seen it a few times. Last week, we looked at a few of those elements. But ultimately, he's saying the imitation of Jesus' self-giving love, that's the, the, the overarching theme of the kingdom culture. But the opposite must be resisted. Love is full of truth and goodness. Anti-love twists and distorts what is good. It speaks in ways that degrade what God has made. So Paul is kind because of his clarity. And let's look at a little bit more at the contours of the kingdom culture. Verse 3 again. But among you there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. Paul tells us what's fitting for us, for God's holy people. And, and notice the verse starts with a contrast, but among you. What's, what's the contrast between? Everything Paul will list next, these things that we could call like vice or virtue or what's good and evil, that's true. But he's really contrasting this way of love with anti-love, with things that disintegrate community, that destroy uh, what God is intending to build. These are anti-kingdom culture ways. And he says, not even a hint. I think that's important. Uh, literally, I just, I just read it through in the Greek text again this week, and it would be more literally translated, just must not even be named among you. Like, don't even speak about these things. Which is kind of like saying, like, don't even think about it. Don't even think about stepping over these ways of being. And I think that's important. Here's why. 
going back to the organizational cultures thing. We can have like stated values. We can have great policies in place. But there can also be this um, unwritten kind of like wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Oh, we don't really take those seriously in practice. Yeah, they're fine to have written as policies, but nobody actually opens up the staff manual anymore. Okay, no, Paul says, in the kingdom, we do care. We do care about it. Don't even flirt with the possibilities of these ways of life. That is not how we do things around here. And then he names some of these anti-love ways. He starts with this combo. It's a pairing of sexual immorality and impurity. The first word here is porneia, and that's where we get the English word porno, graphy, right? Porneia, sexual immorality, sexuality expressed outside God's good design, and then you add graphe onto it. Graphe means writing or some kind of uh, image or way of portraying it. So it's a graphic depiction of immorality for the sake of more and more immorality. And that second word, impurity, it's, it typically refers also to sexual sin. And so Paul is doubling up the emphasis here. He's saying our sexuality is to be expressed within this committed covenant of marriage between one man and one woman, and anything outside of this is not fitting for kingdom people. And as we see in, in Matthew 5, Jesus um, doesn't just leave it in terms of outward behavior. He even says this matters about what's going on in our hearts. He says that to lust after somebody with the intent of like fantasizing about that person in a sexual manner is, is out. It's, that's also adultery, he calls it. And lust is profoundly damaging, not only because it, it fuels an industry that misuses sex and human bodies, but it also dehumanizes others and those who participate in it. It makes people an object to be used rather than recognizing their God-given dignity. And when we dehumanize other people, we dehumanize ourselves in the process. I've heard it said like this, I protect the image of God in myself when I respect the image of God in others. And I think the opposite is also true. I dehumanize myself when I don't honor the image of God in others. There's this idea in our world that says that, you know, any sort of expression of sexuality is good and normal as long as it's consensual, like as long as it's not hurting anybody. But God's story tells it different than that. It talks about what real love is, and that includes how we use our bodies. See, the reality is in God's good story, sex is God's good idea. Like a fire that's in a fireplace of a home, it provides light and warmth and a sense of, of, uh, of wholeness and comfort to a home. But a fire anywhere else in the house will burn it down. That's true of our sexuality as well. Fundamental to the Christian worldview is this belief that God exists and he has put boundaries around our sexuality because he loves us. Sam Albury, he puts it like this, God cares who we sleep with because he cares deeply about the people who are doing the sleeping. He cares because sex was his idea, not ours. He cares because misusing sex can cause profound hurt and damage. He cares because he regards us as worthy of his care. And in fact, that care is not only seen in telling us how we should use sex, but is also in how he makes forgiveness and healing available when we mess this up. So not everything that we call love really is love or loving. Living within God's good design by his wisdom, it protects people, it honors people, that's love. And Sam is right. God makes forgiving and healing available when we mess this up. And I know that maybe there's some in this room who need to hear that afresh and again and to know that you can have a fresh start today in this area. Here's the next thing. Paul mentions greed. Now, it could be still a sense of overlap with these other two that have been paired because greed is a sense of lusting for more and more. But it's not just that. At the heart of greed is a heart that says, I'm, I'm dissatisfied with God and what God has given me. I must have more of something else, something more to fill my heart, to give me fullness. And whenever we, we find ourselves saying something like that, 
like taking uh, good things, maybe it's financial stability, maybe it's a relationship with another, another person, uh, maybe it's just success in general. Whenever we find ourselves saying, taking that good thing and making it ultimate thing, it becomes a God thing. It becomes an idol of our hearts. And this is why Paul, he'll go on to restate these three things again. He'll say those who belong to the kingdom, um, he'll link up these three things and, and call that idolatry. Why? Because it's making something more fundamental to my sense of identity and my life than God himself. But notice next, kingdom culture also defines what we do with our lips, with our words. Look at verse 4. Nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk, or co coarse joking, which are out of place. Again, they're not the way we do things around here. They're out of place, but rather thanksgiving. Obscenity, foolish talk, coarse jesting. What's the big deal, we might wonder? Like, words are just words. Jokes are just jokes. Well, words have power. Lots of power. Power to build up or power to tear down. Words create worlds. Words make cultures. And in the kingdom culture, as we heard in, in 429 last week, words are used to build others up according to their needs. That's how we're to use our words in the kingdom. So obscenity, foolish talk, coarse joking, they're out of place because they mock the good, they... Um, they normalize the ugly and the awful. They cut people down. Uh, obscenity, I think, is about taking, again, God's good design for human bodies and sex and making a world that demeans and cheapens God's good gift. Foolish talk, coarse joking, I think that would maybe translate and refer to things in our world like, you know, sexist jokes or racist jokes. Jokes that dehumanize others, ways of speaking that are intended to cut others down even if we think it's, it's funny. Again, these are jokes that would dehumanize rather than respect the image of God in others. You no, know what's interesting though is, is the antidote. Look at it. It says, but rather, thanksgiving. It's using our mouths, using our lips to praise that which is good and true and beautiful. And that starts with God and then spills out to those around us. So in kingdom culture, we use our lips to build up and praise that which is deserving of honor. And now finally, the reality check at the end, the warning, verse 5. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of God, or of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Let no one deceive you, Paul says, with empty words. Like following Jesus, following this way of love and resisting all these ways of anti-love and the darkness, these are not matters of mere preference. What we do with these sets our trajectory either in the direction of kingdom life or anti-kingdom life. And look again, Paul restates these three features, immoral, impure, or greedy, and he links them with idolatry, with something about loving God or loving something other than God as our first and best. Now, if, we, if love is self-giving for the sake of others, and it is, these other things destroy that harmony, that peace, that wholeness, that kind of community God intends. And so that's why no one who would say, I can persistently and unrepentantly live in this kind of way and expect to inherit the kingdom of God, that would be nonsense. Because in the kingdom of God, those things have no place. You can't carry those things into the kingdom space. How could the kingdom be full of things that are anti-love. So Paul brings us back to what we might see as a dirty word, God's wrath, he says. Now, if you remember, we saw back in Ephesians chapter 2, I took more time on it there, but God's wrath is God's settled opposition to anything that distorts or destroys his good creation. As Paul argues in Romans chapter 1, God's wrath is even expressed in the present time. God is giving people over to 
the consequences of their choices to their anti-love and anti-God ways of life. If you want to live anti-God, God will say, okay, I will honor your freedom to do so. But you are choosing a trajectory that will disintegrate your life and that will go on forever until you turn. So God gives people to the darkness of the darkness. And that even happens in the now and then will be eternally so for those who continue to reject Jesus and his way of life he invites us into. So to be super clear, Paul does not mean if you've struggled with lust, if you've struggled with greed, if you've used your mouth in foul ways, you are excluded from the kingdom. That's not what he means. He does mean those who would persist in living that kind of way, who'd be like, I don't need to turn from that. I don't need to turn back to God. He would say, if that's your heart, God will give you over to that forever. You will not have a place in the kingdom if that's what you want to do, which on the flip side says, if you do want to turn to God, his arms are wide open. Jesus lets his life break to heal and forgive us from that way. For those who turn back, there is hope, there's forgiveness, there's new life. All of that Jesus gave his life to free us from so we could live for him. And and he spills it out like this. Again, back to the greatest sermon ever preached, Jesus says this. He says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are those who want what God wants. Blessed are those who want to line themselves up to live in the way that God is calling them to live. I think C.S. Lewis uh, says it right when he comments on that. He says, it's safe to tell the pure in heart that they shall see God because only the pure in heart want to. Do you want to see God? Do you long for closeness with him? That indicates the condition of your heart. That indicates that you are a person of the kingdom if you want to live in kingdom ways. We could put it like this. The kingdom people want to please their loving leader, Jesus. And in my experience, when I step outside of those uh, of, of the bounds, when I step into anti-love ways of being, my heart breaks. I feel sick because I want to be like Jesus. I want to be the pure in heart. I want to see God. I want to be an imitator of God. I don't want to grieve the Spirit, as Paul said in in 4.3. So there is this time when regularly I have to turn, and I turn back to the one who is love and who's loved me in this way. So keeping close to Jesus, open to the Spirit, doing regular heart checks, that leads to a turning back to love himself. That's a regular part of my rhythm, and I think that's a part of why Jesus teaches us to pray, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us, because we'll need to keep in that rhythm. That's not to to make you feel uh, overwhelmed. It's to say there is new life, and it's for you. I'm going to call the worship team to come forward, and, and, uh, and as they come, maybe there's an invitation for you today in, in even hearing that last piece. Maybe Maybe today is the day for realigning your heart, your life with the king and his kingdom culture. Maybe you've been giving yourself to just ways that are anti-love, that are against the ways of the kingdom. And today is a day that you can turn back to the king and he will forgive you and heal you. Maybe he'll straighten that suit again and say, remember who you are. Remember who you are in me. I'm going to invite you to stand, and and as you do, I just want to maybe just bless you with this. So in light of all of this today that we've heard, we do imitate God. Like father, like daughter and son. We do put on the new clothes, the beautiful way of life that's fitting for the kingdom culture. We do put away all these ways that would dehumanize others and ourselves or make God out to be less beautiful than he really is. So may we be marked, even if it's not the ink of a tattoo like Matt's, may we be marked, stamped across our lives, imitators of God. Let me pray for you. God, we do thank you that the culture of the kingdom is set by the character of the king. And we open ourselves to living that out. Amen.